to be recorded. I just want you all to know that. So I'm very happy to, to be here today and to introduce Tonya Poti. Um, this is our, gonna be our first CPC uh, webinar. So we'll see how it goes. We hope it goes very well. Um, so let me first introduce myself briefly. I'm Krista Pereira and I'm in the Department of Social Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. And Tonya Petit is my wonderful colleague in the Department of Social Medicine. She's an assistant professor and she's a clinician and researcher trained as a physician assistant who has provided a culturally aware gender affirming medical care for LGBTQ individuals since 1996. And in addition to all of that, in, to, in addition to her clinical care, she is conducting research in partnership with transgender communities since 2010. And her current research is affiliated with the UNC Center for Health, Center for Health Equity Research, the UNC Center for AIDS Research, as well as the Carolina Population Center. I've been so happy to work with her. Um, She's just an absolutely lovely person in addition to being an excellent researcher. And I know we're gonna enjoy this talk so much. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tonya. Thank you so much, Krista, for that really kind introduction. I appreciate it. And I'm excited to see so many people here today interested in this topic. Um, my goal is to spend um, maybe the next 40 minutes or so um, doing a quick introduction to the RISE lab and an overview of some terminology that I'll be using, and then spend the bulk of the time talking about the conceptual frameworks that I use for my research and how they inform the conduct of those research through examples of some uh, HIV projects with trans communities that I've conducted. So the RISE lab stands for Research and Sexual and Gender Minority Health Equity. We had a little contest with the folks in the lab to come up with the name. Um, as Krista mentioned, we are in the Center for Health Equity Research within the Department of Social Medicine. And we are doing a lot of different projects right now. We have a great team of people. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to go through all of those projects, but at the end, I'll have a link to our website, which will uh, describe each of those projects in detail. So to start with just the quick definitions and overview, um, the word transgender or trans is a word I'll use to describe people whose gender identity is different from the sex that they were assigned at birth, usually on the original birth certificate. Trans women will refer to women with, of trans experience and trans men will refer to men of trans experience. Gender non-binary will be a term that I'll use to describe people who either identify as neither male nor female, a combination of both or somewhere outside of that dichotomy altogether. And the word cisgender or cis will be used to describe people whose gender identity aligns with their birth assigned, um, their sex assigned to them at birth. In terms of the number of transgender people in the United States, um, a think tank out of UCLA called the Williams Institute that focuses on LGBTQ issues um, analyzed data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, which is a population based survey that is conducted annually in the United States. And it asked a question about uh, whether or not the participants identify as transgender. And based on that data, they estimate that about 1.4 million people identify as transgender in the United States. There are some data globally. A, a group did a meta-analysis a few years ago and estimated about 25 million people identify as transgender globally. But obviously that's a, typically an undercount in terms of people willing to disclose and who identify with that term altogether. So next I'd like to walk through a few of the conceptual frameworks that guide my work. Um, this tiny little picture in the corner is a social determinants of health um, diagram. Um, and it just is to remind us that the social, structural, and institutional factors that lie outside the individual tend to have the greatest um, determination of population health and individual health. And one of those social determinants of health is stigma. Stigma can take many forms and it is inclusive of discrimination. Um, stigma was first outlined by a social psychologist, Irvin Goffman. Um, and it has been expanded and expounded by other researchers, including Lincoln Phelan, who are researchers out of Columbia University, that really um, brought to the forefront the role of power in stigma and the fact that it's a process. And it's a process in which people are labeled, stereotyped, divided from other people, they lose social status, are discriminated against, and these have real consequences for people's lives and people's health. 
intersectionality is a lens that requires us to look at those power structures along multiple axes of oppression. So not just one identity or one social position, but many impact whether people have advantage or disadvantage in various contexts. And if we put those together, it's called intersectional stigma. And there's a growing body of research on in using intersectional stigma lenses. And in fact, the NIH next Friday is going to be doing a um, several hour webinar on intersectional stigma research. And I encourage you to join that if you're available. And you want to point out there might be a cameo appearance by some cats, either verbally or visibly. So welcome them if they join us. Um, in, in terms of the word embodiment, I wanted to include that because it's how I think about the ways that stigma and discrimination as social determinants of health um, impact the, someone's body in on a population basis or an individual basis. So intersectional stigma operates at the structural level, at the institutional level, and at the individual level. And you'll see some examples um, on the slide of, of what that looks like. It also operates through either direct forces or indirect forces. So for example, someone may experience structural stigma by being discriminated against in healthcare, being denied healthcare. That has direct consequences for the person's health because they may not be able to get life-saving care that they need. On the other hand, someone might experience indirect consequences, such as the experiences of stigma and discrimination, increasing stress, um, elevating rates of depression, um, and that can lead to increased risk behaviors that are then associated with uh, health inequities. Um, along with, what does this mean for the research that I do with, uh, in, with transgender communities? Um, in partnership with colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, we consolidated some of these concepts into an overall conceptual framework for transgender health justice. And that framework, I won't go into all the details in this slide, I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested, but there are three main strategies that we try to use when conducting research in this area. And one is, in identifying and make plain the, the structure powers that are behind the health inequities that we see, working to identify ways to disrupt the status quo of stigma and discrimination, and to center the embodied knowledge or the realities of the people who are participating in the research studies. And so that's what I aim to do in, in my work. And hopefully you'll see that come through as I go through the next few examples. I'd like to start with the research um, that I've done internationally. Most of my research recently has been done in South Africa. Just as background, South Africa is a middle income, black majority, multi-ethnic, multi-racial country. Their racial categories are different from the ones that we use in the United States. And you can see them listed there. And for many, many years, the society was segregated both financially, economically, and geographically by these racial categories under a system called apartheid. Apartheid officially ended in 1994, and in 1996, South Africa developed one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Um, it guarantees rights to uh, health, um, and it bans discrimination based on sex, gender, and sexual orientation. However, despite this constitution, it remains aspirational, as many constitutions do, and there are structural legacies of apartheid that still persist in, this in, in the country. There are racial disparities because of this in poverty, education, healthcare, and a variety of other sectors. And some studies suggest that this inequality is greater now than it was at the end of apartheid. There also is also pervasive stigma and discrimination against sexual and gender minorities. And one example of that is what's called corrective in quotes, rape, in which people are raped in order to try to make them um, conform to their sex assigned at birth or to a heterosexual sexual orientation. South Africa also has a, one of the highest burdens of HIV in the world, and the general population prevalence of HIV in South Africa is about 20%. For a long time, there wasn't any data separated out for transgender women, but the Centers for Disease Control um, recently conducted a respondent-driven sampling study, so a population-based study, a representative sample, with over 800 uh, transgender women, and found an incredibly high prevalence of HIV. Um, the lowest was in a fairly rural area called East London at 50%, and the highest in uh, urban area of Johannesburg of 73%. So given this high burden of HIV among transgender women in South Africa, 
um, I was approached at the International AIDS Conference in 2016 by Leanne um, Vandermark. And Leanne runs a trans-led organization who focuses on the, the health and well-being of the LGBTQ community and particularly with trans people. And she was interested in doing a study that gathered information on the knowledge, behaviors, um, structural drivers, and factors associated um, with HIV for transgender women. And we named the study the Trans Women Mobilizing and Preparing for High Impact Prevention. The first aim of the study was to identify barriers and facilitators for trans women engaging in um, HIV prevention or care, and to also look at the factors that affected healthcare provision by healthcare providers in South Africa. The study was led and implemented by mostly trans women. There were four co-investigators on the study. Three of them were residents of South Africa, two of them were trans women, and three of them were people of color. We trained six data collectors to implement the study and they were all trans women of color. Data was collected in Johannesburg, Cape Town, and East London. It included 214 valid quantitative interviews, so about 70 per city with trans women. We also conducted 36 qualitative interviews, about 12 per city with trans women, and then 18 key informant interviews with medical providers to try to address the aims of the study. I obviously don't have time to go through all the data. We have a ton of data and we're just digging into analyzing a lot of it now. And we have uh, one publication out from it so far and are working on several others. What I do wanna highlight is that this, this was a very young study population. So the mean age was 27 years old. Um, the majority of the sample was black. Um, there was a high rate of unemployment at 25% and a very high rate of poverty. Um, over half of the participants lived in poverty and 27% lived in extreme poverty. And at the time of the study, the RAND to the US dollar um, conversion was about five to one. So in US dollars, people in extreme poverty lived on less than $100 a month. 20% of the people who participated had been homeless and there are incredibly high rates of violence victimization, um, both psychological, physical, and sexual violence. So it wasn't surprising when we also saw the HIV outcomes that we, we did in this study. HIV risk behavior was high with 38% uh, of the participants having engaged in receptive condomless anal sex in the past year. However, rates of HIV testing was also high. And I think that's consistent with a country that's really dedicated a lot of attention and resources to ensuring that everybody has access to HIV testing. But when we look at prevention and care, um, only about half of the people who participated in the study had heard of PrEP before, and PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a one pill once a day regimen that prevents HIV acquisition in people who are HIV negative. Then we looked at people who had ever taken PrEP. It was incredibly low. Only 20 of the participants had ever taken PrEP, and that was um, and among the people who were HIV negative and therefore eligible and who knew where to get PrEP, which was obviously a barrier that needed to be overcome, still only 40% um, had ever taken PrEP. When we looked at the participants who were HIV positive, about a third of the participants self-reported being HIV positive. We didn't have um, testing as part of this study. Um, most of them who reported being HIV positive had taken antiretroviral therapy and 82% um, in terms of an undetectable viral load is fairly good. It's about the same as what we see in the United States. So that's excellent. Um, but one, uh, one cause for concern is that there was a large proportion of the participants who'd experienced treatment interruptions. And persistent adherence to antiretroviral therapy is very important for maintaining the health of the individual living with HIV, as well as for prevention of ongoing transmission. When we looked at what might be some of the barriers to PrEP and HIV care, we looked at factors that were associated with PrEP awareness, and we saw that a larger proportion of the participants who lived in Johannesburg or Cape Town, so the urban areas, were aware of PrEP, and that people who had an income higher than the poverty level, um, more of those participants had heard of PrEP. So not necessarily the most vulnerable people. And unfortunately, Participants who were less likely to engage in receptive anal sex and who um, perceived their HIV risk to be low were also more likely to have heard of PrEP. So not really reaching all the people who would be um, most at need for pre-exposure prophylaxis. 
For the people who had had a treatment interruption, we asked them for their reasons um, that they couldn't obtain their antiretroviral therapy. The top reason was not being able to get transportation. The second was having experienced negative attitudes when they went to get their medication and having sold their medication or given their medication to someone who needed it. So obviously these are structural barriers like transportation, stigma and discrimination that um, leads to the negative attitudes. And um, keeping in mind that the people who gave their medication to someone who needed it were also people who needed the medication. So there was this effort to try to support and help other people by sharing their medications. This sort of community connection was consistent with what we found in our measures of community connection. 93% of the respondents reported feeling that they were part of a community of transgender women. And this community connection could also be a source of resilience. And we saw that come through in a particularly uh, salient quote from the qualitative research. One of the participants who was a 22 year old black um, trans woman who was on pre-exposure prophylaxis described, and you can read it yourself here, I won't read it aloud to you. But in summary, she and a group of friends had a WhatsApp group and they always took their medication together at the same time. And if someone didn't respond at the time that they were supposed to meet, they reached out and tried to uh, get that person to join them. And if the, there were barriers, like they didn't have enough money to pay for the airtime to join the group, then they offered to support that person. So they really use this sense of community connection to help facilitate um, adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I think as HIV researchers and people who care a lot about ensuring that people have access to prevention and care, building on and supporting these uh, community connections and the innovations that communities derive themselves can be a really important way that we contribute uh, to the health and well-being of communities. Um, next, I'll, I'll move on to talk about some of my domestic work, which is where most of my work has been. We look at HIV prevalence in the United States, the US population has an HIV prevalence of about 0.3%. Um, gender non-binary people's HIV prevalence is about 0.4%. This is based on very limited data, self-reported data from the US Trans Survey. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has um, published meta-analysis of laboratory confirmed HIV prevalence for transgender men and transgender women, and you see the rates there about 3% for trans men and about 14% for trans women. So enormous disparities by gender. And we also see within those categories, disparities by race with um, black trans women uh, followed by La uh, Latina trans women having the highest proportion of HIV. So with awareness of this national data on the disproportionate impact of HIV among Black and Latina trans women, um, when I arrived as a new faculty member at Johns Hopkins, I applied for funding from their Center for AIDS Research to better understand the local context of HIV in, um, among Black and Latina trans women there. And that was through a study that we called the STROBE study, Supporting Transgender Research and Opportunities in the Baltimore Environment. We had lots of community partners that you see listed there, as well as a, a really awesome research team. The aims of the study were really to uh, understand and develop a response to the burden of HIV among Black and Latina trans women in Baltimore and Washington, DC through formative qualitative research that would then inform a quantitative survey and HIV testing in the community. The interviews were conducted in English and Spanish. We were fortunate enough to get supplemental funding for um, Spanish translation and to hire an amazing Spanish interviewer. And HIV testing was done with a rapid or a quick test so that we could provide results to the participant um, on site. We completed the qualitative key informant interviews and focus groups and 200 um, quantitative surveys. Then if we pull out similar data to what we saw from the data in South Africa, we see that both in South Africa and the United States, there are enormous structural vulner vulnerabilities um, for transgender women. So um, the participants were not surprisingly majority black, about 54 of the participants identified as Latina or Hispanic of any race. For the participants who were insured, the majority of them had public insurance like Medicaid or Medicare. Unstable housing was common with over almost 60% of the participants um, having been unstably housed in the prior year. And a shocking uh, almost 76% had an income below the federal poverty line. 
We also saw high rates of HIV um, with about 56% of the participants testing positive for HIV and 9% of the people who tested positive, um, for them it was a new test for positive test results. So they did not know that they were HIV positive before they were tested in the study. We also saw very high rates of violence. Um, we've seen, uh, hopefully if you've been paying attention, there's increasing attention to the violence against transgender communities. Unfortunately, this has been accompanied by a rising reporting of violence, particularly against black trans women in the United States. And the participants who were in this study, um, I think, exemplify that. You see that people had very high rates of threats of violence, um, as well as physical and sexual violence. And unfortunately, people experienced high rates of poly victimization with uh, over seven being the number of forms of violence that people had experienced. And this, of course, has implications for engagement in HIV prevention and care. If we focus on the HIV positive participants, we saw actually um, surprisingly good engagement in care. And I will say that probably this was related to our recruitment methods where our partners were often um, health centers that provided HIV care as well as gender affirming care. Um, so most participants um, had had an HIV visit in the prior year, they were on antiretroviral therapy and they had an undetectable viral load. However, we also saw high rates of treatment interruptions in this sample, similar to what we saw in South Africa. And one of the things you wanted to do is understand more deeply um, the mechanisms or the causes behind these treatment interruptions. Jay Sebelius is a researcher at a University of California who developed a gender affirmation framework to help explain how intersectional stigma led to elevated HIV risk behavior among transgender women of color. And we wanted to see if this mechanism could also explain the HIV treatment interruptions that we were seeing um, in uh, our study with Black and Latino transgender women in Baltimore and DC. So we needed to operationalize uh, social oppression, um, psychological distress, and in this model, social oppression decreased participants' access to gender affirmation and psychological distress increased their need for gender affirmation. And this led to what was called identity threat and led to engagement in high-risk context and high-risk behavior. So for our study, um, we used the data that we had to operationalize these concepts of social oppression, psychological distress, unmet need for gender affirmation, and high-risk context. And the unmet need for gender affirmation is important because in the conceptual frameworks that I showed you before, they were rather general. And what is specific around uh, the impact of, a, of intersectional stigma for trans populations is how it impacts the need for gender affirmation. So for this study, we operationalize it as um, being on gender affirming hormone therapy, having access to surgery when people wanted it, and having access to legal gender affirmation, such as identity documents that matched um, someone's gender. On the bivariate analysis, we saw associations between these aspects of social oppression um, and gender affirmation and a history of treatment interruptions. And on multivari in the multivariable model, what remains significant is that being on hormone therapy was associated with the reduced odds of a treatment interruption. Having unmet surgical needs, so desiring gender affirming surgery and not having access to it was associated with an elevated odds of a treatment interruption. And for reasons that we have yet to explain, marijuana use was associated with a greater odd of um, antiretroviral treatment interruptions. So it answered our question about whether meeting the medical gender affirming needs for Black and Latino trans women could reduce treatment interruptions. When we looked at the qualitative results, we saw several themes. Um, one was a distrust of medical establishments, which is very common um, among Black and Latina communities in Baltimore writ large and also consistent with what we heard from the trans community. People felt like there was too much focus on HIV and not as much focus on holistic support, which was important to the community. The key informants had several recommendations, including hiring transgender women of color to lead programs, offering gender affirming care and staff training, offering services in places where trans women of color felt comfortable, and tailoring services and being responsive to community needs. And this was heavy on my mind in terms of understanding community needs as we think about supporting HIV prevention and care for trans communities. Um, as I moved to North Carolina, 
and came home um, to accept this job at UNC and to be in the place where I grew up. Um, fortunately, an opportunity came along to help me understand what the specific needs might be for trans people in the South and particularly in North Carolina when funding became available through a federal plan called Ending the F HIV Epidemic. This is a federal plan who set a national goal to reduce new HIV infections by 75% over the next five years and 90% over the next 10 years. The funding was made available that prioritized 48 metropolitan areas and seven states. The metropolitan areas included Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and one of the states was South Carolina. The UNC Center for AIDS Research brought together people um, in public health and in HIV research across North Carolina and South Carolina to form a collaborative called Carolinas United to End HIV or QHIV. And through this process, we applied for funding as a supplement to the UNC CIFAR and we're funded for a project called Transforming the Carolinas, Ending the HIV Epidemic for Transgender People of Color. And it included partnerships with community organizations, researchers, um, and healthcare providers in Mecklenburg County, um, two cities in uh, near Columbia, Columbia and Greenville, South Carolina, and sort of the low country in Charleston, South Carolina. The aims of the study were really to identify regionally relevant drivers of um, HIV disparities, to map what community assets were available to address these barriers, and to engage community stakeholders in prioritizing um, both the barriers and the assets to address those barriers. And we received funding for that for this project last year, and we are still in the process of data collection. We partnered with Equality North Carolina to complete the policy inventory and analysis, and that has already been completed, and I'll share with you a few of the infographics that a wonderful intern has developed for us. Um, and we completed the key informant interviews, and I'll describe a little bit about those. And we are in the process of completing the quantitative survey and the focus groups. And I'll share some of the preliminary data from the quantitative surveys around the community priorities. So here are a few of the infographics that we are in the process of developing and finalizing in partnership with Equality North Carolina that depict some of the policy barriers that are faced by transgender people, um, especially around HIV. So few, few protections against hate, hate crimes, um, for against uh, people based on their gender identity. Um, healthcare laws um, are allowed to discriminate in providing gender affirming care. Um, there are no protections in terms of housing and HIV criminalization laws really discourage people from HIV testing and, dis and disclosure. When we looked at the community priorities, um, I grouped the top five community priorities by um, structural priorities like preventing violence, harassment, bullying, and having access to safe and affordable housing, and gender affirmation priorities like insurance coverage, access to gender-related care, and access to the ability to change gender documents. Importantly, no one who's completed the survey has selected HIV information and prevention as their top priority, and only one person selected HIV treatment information as their top priority which is consistent with what we've seen in other research in other areas. So as we've been thinking about how to take this information and act upon it, we thought about what the key informants had to say to us. And many of the key informants were people who led either transgender run organizations um, or HIV care organizations. And we found that many of these organizations actually had resources that could help mitigate some of the policy barriers that we saw and address some of the community priorities. But there is a disconnect between the provision of these services and access to those services by transgender people of color. So we applied for funding for a project called Transforming the Carolinas 2.0 with the goal of linking those resources that had been identified by key informants um, to meet the community priorities. So what we proposed was to develop a community health worker training module where we would hire and train transgender people of color to be community health workers and allow them to and support them in providing linkage to services and reducing barriers to care. And we would pilot using um, a stigma informed digital platform that was developed by Dr. He Lisa Hightow-Wedman to implement this. Um, 
And that turned out to be more important than we thought when COVID hit and we realized that engaging people um, through digital means might be what we have to rely on for a while as um, in-person contact becomes more limited. Of course, communities don't wait for researchers to develop interventions for them. And um, I wanna provide an example of how some of the transgender community leaders have been responding over the long term to community needs and also in the short term to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. One of those examples is the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. That's a national organization that has three main goals, a health, housing, and employment. And they work um, to provide HIV testing and linkage to care as part of their health platform. They train shelters and try to link um, houseless trans people to gender affirming shelters as part of their housing program. And they train employers to be gender affirming and to hire transgender people. And they provide job readiness training in terms of resume development and interview skills for transgender people. And in response to the COVID-19 crisis, they also developed a rapid response fund where they help support people through micro grants. So the focus of most of that research has been on how can we really look at the structural barriers that directly impact access to care and services for transgender people. But I'm also interested in how stigma and discrimination becomes physiologically embodied beyond the access to care and services. How does the, the stress of experiencing the level of stigma, discrimination and violence um, endured by uh, particularly trans people of color affect the body? The minority stress model is one way to think about this. So the minority stress models have been around for a long time. There've been, uh, I've seen lots of investigation of the impact of minority stress on heart disease, particularly in African-American communities. Um, in 1981, um, Virginia Brooks, uh, I think wrote the first paper looking at uh, minority stress among lesbian women and its impact on psychological health. Elon Meyer expanded this model to include first gay men and then LGB communities writ large. Uh, TESTA expanded this model and published a paper in 2015 to include transgender people. Um, and there has been some critique of this model that it doesn't necessarily address intersecting stigmas. So I will overlay <laughs> intersecting stigma and particularly the intersecting stigmas that are experienced by transgender women living with HIV. And you can see here just on its face, the majority of transgender women living with HIV are racial and ethnic minorities. So they experienced um, immigration status stigma, racial stigma, HIV status stigma, gender um, related stigma. And all of those things are minority stressors that can impact um, health outcomes. So you see the bottom arrow that leads from minority stress to negative health outcomes. But an import, another important part of this is that resilience resources can really help mitigate that. So um, having uh, coping skills or helping to promote coping skills, providing social support and community connection can really mitigate the impact of these um, minority stressors um, while we work to also get rid of those structural factors that cause minority stress. So I applied for funding from the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities to look at transgender women living with HIV and how embodied, how stigma becomes embodied in that group. And that study is called Light Plus. The goal of the study was to quantify the relationship between intersectional stigma and chronic stress using biomarkers, to look at the pathways that link these biomarkers to comorbidities among trans women living with HIV, and we chose a mental health comorbidity, um, particularly depression and PTSD, which we know are elevated in uh, trans communities, and cardiovascular disease, for which there is very little data. We know that People living with HIV have um, higher risk for cardiovascular disease, and we suspect that trans women may have elevated risk for cardiovascular disease, but very rarely do people look at these together. So the goal is to enroll 200 Black and Latina transgender women in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, I mean, I'm sorry, Washington, D.C. and Boston, Massachusetts. And those were selected because there are federally qualified community health centers there that focus on providing services for the LGBTQ community and they're uh, seen as gender affirming sites. So Whitman Walker in Washington, D.C. and Fenway Health um, in Boston. In terms of measuring chronic stress, we are working with a researcher um, at the Institute for Salivary Bioscience, um, who has done a lot of work on how to use salivary cortisol to measure stress. 
we developed the um, the videos that you see to the left and you can find on YouTube if you'd like uh, to help train the participants on how to collect salivary cortisol themselves. Um, those waking 30 minutes later and at bedtime to give us a diurnal curve. And you can see sort of example on the right hand side of what that might look like. And then to include that as part of a measure of allostatic load. Now allostatic load is derived from a concept called allostasis and it's our body's adaptive process to try to seek and maintain homeostasis when we're exposed to either physical or psychological stressors. Over time, adaptation to these repeated stressful experiences takes a toll on the body. People might have heard this called the weathering effect as well. And this cumulative stress leads to multi-system physiologic dysregulation. And it can be measured through assessing um, neuroendocrine, inium, uh, immune, metabolic, and cardiovascular biomarkers. And you see listed here the 17 uh, measures that we, would, we plan to include in our allostatic load measure. And if someone's results for these measures are within the 25 to 75th percentile or in a normal range for the values that have a normal range, then they get a zero. And if they're outside the normal range or outside the central um, percentile, then they get a one. Then you total all the scores together to give the allostatic load in index. So you get a sense of the burden or the cumulative stress um, that people have been manifesting physiologically. Hopefully that made sense. Our study design is to follow people for 24 months to, in, um, when they're enrolled at baseline, they um, provide salivary cortisol samples, do a baseline survey, clinical measures and blood work. And then annually, we repeat the salivary cortisol measures and blood work um, at 12 months and 24 months. And then every six months, we see them for clinical measures, uh, a survey, and then a subset of participants will complete uh, qualitative interviews. So far, we've enrolled 36 participants for their baseline visits. 35 of them identify as black and one is black, one identifies as both black and Latina. All of them have been screened for salivary cortisol participation. Um, a few were ineligible because they were on steroids and that interferes with the ability to interpret the results and two declined to participate. So that left us with 28 people who are so far enrolled in the home cortisol collection. Of those participants, 19 were on gender-affirming hormones, um, 18 had been diagnosed with depression, and 13 of them still had symptoms of depression based on the survey results. And 11 of the participants had reported being diagnosed with PTSD and also had symptoms consistent with PTSD. And then in March, the pandemic hit. And so like all of you, our research was set on pandemic pause. And so we had to really think over the last several months about how do we move forward in a study that really relies a lot on um, biomarker data. So we've modified our protocol and hope to resume data collection in October. The first thing that we wanted to do was to check in with the participants who were already enrolled. And so we sent them a message letting them know that we were thinking about them, that we understand that this is a difficult and stressful time, and providing them with resources that we were aware of where they could um, access microgrants or other kinds of support. Of course, we will have a lot to think about as we move towards analysis and how this incredibly stressful event will impact um, how we interpret our data. In order to help us to do that, we added some COVID-19 questions to the survey drawn from the NIH repository of questions. And we moved the survey to um, the survey part of data collection to phones for all future visits. So we could limit the amount of time anybody would have to spend in the clinical space. That meant that we had to drop some of the clinical measures for the six and 18 month visits. Um, as you probably know, NIH came out with a ton of um, funding opportunity announcements related to COVID-19, and we've been working with two community-based organizations to try to um, use that funding to provide information and support for the community-led interventions. So the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition, who I've already described, and a Black Trans Woman-led organization called Trans Solutions Consulting. So Light Connect is an application um, that looks to follow a cohort of trans women and trans men. Um, and looking at COVID-19 testing and outcomes. And we are working with BTAC right now for, in response to a funding opportunity announcement, looking at how to mitigate the psychosocial impacts of COVID-19 
and we want to um, understand the impacts of their microgrant program and their peer mentoring, peer mentoring program together. So overall, our ultimate goal through all of this is to support trans resilience. And this is Laverne Cox. You might be familiar with her as one of the lead actresses in um, Orange is the New Black. And she's also been a, a strong leader in the trans community and very outspoken. She's on the cover of Time Magazine. This is the first uh, Black trans woman to ever be on the cover of Time Magazine. And she said, what makes me most proud to be Black and trans is the legacy of strength, resilience, and courage from which I'm descended. And I think, I feel like, my job and um, other of us, others of us who do trans health justice research is to support that resilience. And so I don't want to close without thanking all the fabulous people who are in the RISE lab. You can see the um, website address there. So if you want to go and look at some of the work that we're doing and read more about these amazing people who are pictured here. And of course, our numerous and wonderful community partners who really stretched not only across the South, North Carolina and South Carolina, but really across the United States and many of the projects that we're working on. And of course, I wanna thank you for taking time on your Friday afternoon uh, to participate in this webinar. And I look forward to our discussion, answering any of your questions um, and hopefully engaging with you after the webinar is over. So thank you very much. Well, that was wonderful, Tanya. Thank you so much for that just beautiful presentation. You covered tremendous amount of ground and I certainly learned a lot. Um, so we're going to now have some time for questions. I think the um, we formally end at around one o'clock. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. And if, if Tonya happens to have additional time, we can keep it open for some additional questions. Um, so if you have a question, what I'd like you to do is, is put that question in the chat box. Uh, the chat, if you put it in the chat box, all the panelists will be able to see the question. Uh, and I'll help Tonya out by, by reading the question out to her. Um, so while you're thinking about your questions and what you want to ask Tonya, um, I have one question that we'll get started <laughs> with. Um, so, we have a lot of uh, doctoral students as well as postdoctoral fellows at, at CPC. And I'm wondering, you know, with, with all this work, what are two or three of the greatest challenges that you've encountered while conducting research with transgender populations, either in the US or abroad? I know that's a, probably a big <laughs> question and you probably have more than two or three three challenges, but, but we know that, you know, the sausage is hard to make and, and really would enjoy hearing um, some of the challenges that you faced and maybe how you've, how you've, how you've managed them. Mm -hmm. um, I think early in the, in my career, um, it was having people actually pay attention to this population and the needs of the population. Um, my dissertation research was with, was with the trans community in Baltimore and um, one of my committee, committee members actually asked me during my dissertation defense um, if I thought I'd ever be able to do work in this area because nobody cared about it. Mm -hmm. That was really disheartening and is really no longer true. Um, NIH has really stepped up and has several funding opportunity announcements that are available and um, I think is growing in their understanding of health disparities faced by trans populations. I'd say the second thing is building trust and relationships in community. I think in any marginalized and especially multi marginalized community, you know, talking to researchers, first of all, isn't their top priority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of people have been burned by uh, healthcare providers, health facilities and researchers who kind of drop in, ask a bunch of questions and then disappear and nothing really changes in their lives. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that I have is sort of building those deeper relationships, ensuring that I'm accountable to communities and trying to do my best to show up, even when it's not a research project, even when it's not funded, but to, to show up in um, care and concern and solidarity with communities. Great. And we really see that reflected in your presentation and how you move from one project to another. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm looking for questions from our audience. If you, if you have a question, you can type it in that chat box. The chat box should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can just type it on in there and uh, we should be able to see it. Well, I hope people have questions because I spent a lot of time whittling down all the millions of things I was planning to say <laughs> to make sure there was time for conversation. Yeah. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, so I can turn it back to you. Um, <laughs> maybe there's like one highlight that you really wish that you could have shared or so uh, an extra piece that you you wanted to that you might want to add. Um, is, is there one little highlight from that you had to cut out that you would like to share? <laughs> Well, it was mostly things around the, how the conceptual framework gets applied to all of their research studies. And um, I did actually take, take out an entire piece um, about violence that I had planned to include because during the research that we did in Baltimore, violence was a really important issue for the community. And a lot of discussion around why are you always talking about HIV when, when we, every time we walk out of the door, we have to wonder if we're going to be killed just for being who we are. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with me. And I also recognized my limitations. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not a trained violence researcher. Um, the funding opportunities I had access to were related to HIV. Um, but we found a way to make some of that work. So we had a meeting with one of the community leaders, um, and she talked with us about what she saw as some of the major drivers of the violence and a lot of violence that trans women experience is from intimate partners. And how can we understand and address the root causes of that intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. And I had some uh, small seed funding from the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies at UCSF to do a small project. And so what we ended up doing was um, engaging and enrolling trans attracted men, which is a term used to describe men who have relationships with trans, cisgender men usually who have relationships with transgender women, and to try to understand their perspectives on their relationships and identify mechanisms and processes by which um, violence occurs in those relationships. And we are analyzing some of that data right now. So I, I guess I wanted to talk about sort of the creative use of funding, like within, we also ask obviously HIV questions and PrEP related questions to understand the risk, HIV risk of the, the men who participated, but also wanted to make sure that we address the, the questions that were important to the community. Great, well, while you were talking, we got three questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start at the, at the top. Um, Let's see, oh, no, four questions. <laughs> so I'm gonna start first with a, a question um, from Olivia. Have you run into issues with accessing funding because of the stigmatization of the population you are studying? Yes, uh, I think absolutely. And sometimes it doesn't show up as like, we don't think this population is worthy, that people rarely say things as blatant as that, but it'll say, they'll say things like, this is such a small population and they have such little contribution to the HIV burden in the United States that, you know, why should we expend energy um, on this population? But I, I, you know, all credit to trans activists who really increased the visibility of trans communities and demanded attention, especially um, activists in the HIV related space. And I feel like our, my job as a researcher is to provide data to support what people are saying. So looking at the heavy burden within that community versus like how many numbers of people can you identify? Terrific, thank you. And, and another question from Elizabeth, how receptive um, are your respondents to providing the specimens? And a sub question of that, uh, how do you explain the more complex markers? The well, the consent form is really long, <laughs> um, but we try to make it as straightforward as possible. We found um, we have a community advisory board sp specifically for that study. And when we described the project to the community advisory board, they were very excited to see something that had an outcome that wasn't about who they had sex with and whether or not they had HIV. They were very supportive of understanding how stress gets embodied and its impact on um, their health and cardiovascular disease in particular. So we had a lot of excitement around it. Um, people 
I expected many more people to refuse to provide a specimen because at the Celebrate Bioscience training, we had to do the three samples a day and it's really not as easy as it looks on a piece of paper. Um, but I've been impressed. We've had a lot of people, as you saw, who agreed to participate and who stayed um, engaged. Terrific. And, and a subset of that question was, how do you explain some of the more complex biomarkers to the participants? We don't go into detail about each of the biomarkers because I honestly don't think people care that much. Mm -hmm. um, we do explain that you know, we're going to use all of the, the data that we gather to get a sense of the impact of chronic stress on their bodies. And I think it's important to weigh, you know, how much detail you provide so that you're giving fully informed consent and how much is overwhelming and people don't want to really hear all that. That makes sense. So here I have another question from Manat. Um, Manat's wondering what kinds of intervention ideas uh, that you're thinking about are collaborating, collaborating with community partners on? Mm -hmm. I love that. Manat is part of the RISE lab and I think she knows the answers to her questions, but she wants me to say them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're working with the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition on right now is a project that basically seeks to evaluate the work that they're doing and to, to infuse a little bit more cash into it. So right now their rapid response funding provides like $100 one time along with some personal protective equipment to anybody, any black trans person who contacts them and, and requests it. And so what we're trying to do is design a program where we can follow people longitudinally, maybe provide grants for a three to six month period and compare that to a one-time infusion. And also to look at whether peer support in addition to that makes a difference. And the idea is to, to provide a proof of concept or some data to support that trans-led organizations know what the community needs. And when they provide it along with that peer support, um, we see better outcomes in terms of mental health and um, social stability. Great, great. Well, we've got a lot of questions, so we're going to keep going. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be shorter in my answers. <laughs> warmed up, but here we go. So um, Bob has a question uh, on allostatic load. Allostatic load is a great measure of wear and tear. Have you thought about the possibility of a comparison group or groups to best assess how stress is affecting the trans population? And who would those comparison groups be? That is a great question. Yes, we thought a lot about this and we would love to do it. Unfortunately, it's incredibly expensive to do this work, which is one of the reasons the sample size is 200 and we only have two sites. Um, I think that there's multiple comparisons we can do. I think comparing um, cis to trans people would give one sense of um, some of the wear and tear, but I think it's important to take racial dynamics into um, into consideration. You know, racism is sort of baked into the structure of the United States, so we can't really ignore that as we think about how people experience wear and tear. Yeah. Thank you. Victor has a question. Have you had any thoughts about things that can be done to encourage cisgender people to be more comfortable with transgender people and their needs? I think that follows nicely from the previous answer. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I think um, <laughs> I have a friend who's a trans man and his fav my favorite statement that he ever said is that transgender people are not unicorns. Um, and I think the more people um, get to know trans people, understand uh, lived experiences of others, um, that can be very helpful. I, there's several uh, trans -led organizations that do community trainings. Um, one of the most impactful trainings that we did when I was working um, as part of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief is that we went to 38 countries and provided gender and sexual diversity training. Mm -hmm. And the most, by far the most impactful part of that training was the panel of community members. They really move the hearts and minds of the people who participated. So I think making that human to human connection is what really changes people. Terrific, yeah. Um, uh, this will be our last question. I believe, oh, no, another one popped up. Um, we are getting close to one o'clock, so we understand if people on the call have to go. Um, so for, this is from Abigail. As both a clinician and a population researcher, and now a CPC fellow, yay, um, how do you reconcile different perspectives on issues of measurement? 
And then a little longer, for example, as a clinician, is it important to allow people to describe their identities in their own terms? But as a population researcher, you have to think about how to measure gender identity in a valid and reliable way that allows for comparisons across different bodies of research. So what's the, is there a tension between the two perspectives and how do you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a big, you know, discussion around measurement, especially since it's a moving target, right? Like cultures are dynamic and how people describe themselves and their experience changes over time. Um, and I have another friend who describes what we sometimes do in research is analytic microaggressions, where we ask people to provide their own identity and then we later just divide them in the ways that we think are most useful for our analysis. Um, what I have seen that I think is useful and less microaggressive is to allow people to do both. So to say, what is your gender identity, for example, and leave an open-ended question. And then say, if you had to select from these options, which would you choose? So you're making visible the categories that you're putting people in, but also providing them an experience of being able to name themselves. And I'm getting more and more aware of how important it is to understand the experience of the participant and taking part in the study and making sure that that experience is empowering as well as the results that we find. Great, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, and this, I think, is going to be our final question. This is a question from Catherine Croft. Um, some of your data suggests that patients place more personal priority on gender affirming care, such as HRT over HIV care. And that is consistent with Catherine's experience as well. Do you have suggestions or does your research indicate best practices for providers as to how to focus on being more inclusive of these care practices in HIV care areas? Yeah, um, that is a good point and absolutely accurate. Um, the Transgender Law Center, which is run by um, a transgender woman of color, did great research um, a few years back looking at um, with transgender people living with HIV and found that people whose HIV care provider was also the provider of their gender affirming hormone therapy were much more likely to be engaged in care and much more likely to successfully mm -hmm. suppress their HIV virus. So we know that that's true. But they also found that when the provi HIV care providers made access to hormone therapy contingent upon being adherent to their HIV therapy, people dropped out of care. Mm -hmm. So I think we just have to be, as healthcare providers in general, more attuned to addressing the priorities of our patients first and then um, linking what their priorities are to sort of the public health goals or the individual health goals around viral suppression and, and adherence and things like that. Something that marketers do really well, but we could do better. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, this was just a terrific um, presentation. I'm so happy that you started us off this semester. And thank you so much for everybody who attended and your questions. We really appreciated them. Tonya, this was fabulous, and we hope to see you again uh, sometime soon, and maybe in person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thanks so much for everybody who came and for the great questions. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>